So I'm really pleased to be joined by uh, Marcia LaRose. Uh, Marcia is the head of HR at Forcoms. Um, so she joined for as uh, in 2002 as a finance manager and as the company grew, so did her role. And Marcia is now the head of HR and oversees the HR function, as well as the personal finance issues such as salaries and tax. Uh, Marcia has the answers to most questions and is a quick, <laughs> a quick problem solver. <laughs> so, I need to update that. <laughs> without, without further ado, I'll, I'll hand over to Marcia. He's going to be speaking a little bit about um, the work that four comms have been doing from a HR perspective um, over the past few months. And then, as usual, there'll be an opportunity to ask uh, a couple of questions at the end. So with that in mind, Marcia, it's over to you. Hi everyone, um, I just wanted to start off by saying we, we as a business have always been really open to things like flexible working. Um, so we had all our senior members of staff, they could work one day a week from home um, with, without requesting anything. And then others could just request time to work from home, change their work pattern. And the vast majority of those were maternity returners. Um, but we did have a few people who were studying, wanted to work 10 days over nine and things like that. So we were always really open to it. And then um, since last year, I think it was, the IT team were in the process of rolling out laptops to everyone. So by the time we'd shut our offices, we'd shut our offices just a bit before the government lockdown. We, we'd already by then sent home uh, vulnerable individuals, people who were caring for people who were, weren't well and people pregnant people and all those sorts of people had gone home already and then we just decided to shut down the office and it worked out to be a week before the, the government shut down but by then about 75 80 percent of staff had laptops so we were all quite geared up to work from home we were just in a great position and um, then following on from our shutdown with the help of the security who was still in our building because there were other offices, businesses in our building that were open. With the help of the security staff, we were able to make sure that um, couriers were sent with um, office chairs and extra screens and things like that. Uh, some staff did purchase their own desk and, and bits and bobs and reimburse those. So I'm sure you guys did as well. Um, and the IT team were on hand to help out with sorting out extra broadband packages and things. Um, so during, the lockdown we and even prior to that when we were just in the office we were always keen for staff to work their hours but not necessarily between 9 and 5 30. Um, we were always really flexible about how people worked all we ever asked is that for people to let somebody in their team know when they'd not be in or they'd be in late or now when they're going to be offline um, and we had some people who were single parents or were carers and they didn't have anyone to share the care and responsibility with. A lot of those requested to be furloughed um, at the beginning and we, and we supported that. And now that schools have started to open and some parents have been given some specific, very specific windows as to when they can drop off and pick up their children. Again, we just ask people to let their teams know when they'll be offline and it's worked well for us. Um, and we also have an individual parent and carer group of um, and they have WhatsApp groups and all sorts going on and they share tips um, to, with each other and it's it's just been great so that's how we've worked with the flexible working and I'm sure a lot of other businesses have been forced into flexible working with, with, where they may not have done um, before but it's kind of worked for us but we were already part way there so we kind of cheated um, it, it, probably um, but yeah and I, I think Obviously, this is the way forward. No one's going back to the office in the way it was before. And so businesses just have to adapt. Um, and that's how we've done it. Um, we also, uh, during lockdown, but uh, conducted some staff surveys. And our main idea was to find out how people were really feeling mentally and emotionally working from home, as well as whether they were prepared or not to even come back to the office. Um, the majority of staff do want to come back to work, but they only want to come back to work two or three days a week, with the largest concern for our London-based team being the travelling. Um, we haven't quite worked out how we're going to get over that, um, but yeah that's that's a big issue um 
the we've always offered free flu jabs with a really low take up this year our survey showed that around 77 percent of staff are looking to take that up um, and, a, and an even larger percentage are willing to take the covid vaccine once it's available and we wouldn't know any of this if we didn't do the staff survey. So I always think it's good for companies to do that. It, it helps you shape how your business is going to look and, and associated costings. Um, so you know where you're at going forward. Um, and the, the last thing or the largest chunk I want to talk about is the BAME ratios. Um, so for ages, there's been this, you know, a certain demographic that works in the comms industries and it's largely been ignored if we're going to be honest with ourselves but following George Floyd's death and the worldwide protests around inequality in general businesses have now seen fit to address the imbalance and they're just stuck now at where to start so you know everyone's updating their policies on their website and saying that we're an equal opportunities employer but that just simply isn't enough i'm afraid and the process of making sure you have better representation in your business will cost you probably more time than money okay so some recruitment agencies because i know some people use recruitment agencies we tend not to look for but some recruitment agencies have picked up on this and all individuals and businesses need to do is to tell those agencies you want you need a certain demographic in your pool before you meet with anyone and they'll soon find somebody for you to see yeah so that there's some things you can force others to do um, as I said, we don't use agencies. We have a dedicated talent manager who sifts through CVs and, sit and redacts a lot of information. Uh, things like everybody's name is redacted, universities are redacted, other languages spoken are removed because that could give games away. And the interviewer only gets the full CV once they agree to meet in the, the candidate. So they have no idea and there's no unconscious bias being used um, for the for prior to them meeting anyone and I know there are some businesses that are thinking oh great um, how can we up our BAME numbers I know what we'll have a grad day and everybody we employ from the grad day will will only be a BAME individual well that's going to hinder your ethnicity pay gap when you go to report that at a later stage because all your BAME people are going to be on lower pay so you've just got to be a bit more sensible about things you're just going to have to advertise in different areas it's there's no point putting that that strap line on the bottom of your policies when you're still advertising at work for an MP or somewhere, you're gonna to have to go somewhere else to advertise that somewhere else, maybe a radio station, it may be the job center, it could be anywhere. You're gonna to have to actively act, which is why I say it's gonna cost time to, to change your demographic in your business. And it's not just for junior roles or for non-client facing roles. You're gonna to have to, act um that's that's me today <laughs> thank you very much for that marcy that's yeah a really uh really useful and, and fascinating insight on, on a few different topics there the the race issue that you picked up on there at the end is, is really interesting i think the point that you make about the need for businesses to see this as a long-term process is really really fundamental because you mentioned there about uh, grad schemes, which is often seen as uh, a, a part of a solution to this issue. Um, but it's really just putting a, a plaster over, over a deep wound because yeah. even when, even if you are able to attract uh, a diverse range of people in, uh, in the junior ends of your organization, what organization are they walking into? Um, what is that gonna mean for your retention uh, and indeed your culture uh, at your, at your organisation. I think what we're struggling with in the industry at the moment, and at last I feel like it is being confronted head on, um, is a real cultural problem. We've got a cultural problem um, with um, quite a middle class culture embedded in and ingrained in, in, in what we do. So I think a lot of the, the stuff that you guys doing, are doing is, is really encouraging, particularly the uh, redacting applications. I think that's absolutely critical. 
um, and, and removing details that might give information about candidates. I think that's a really smart move. Um, I mean, you've been working in the industry for, for quite a number of years now. And what's your feeling now in terms of where the industry is going from here? Do you feel like there is now a real momentum behind uh, these issues? And do you feel we're on the cusp of genuine change? Yes, if you've got management who want change, you're going to get change, okay, because it, it really does need to come from the top and there really needs to be good direction and what people are actually aiming for. Um, at four, we're aiming to um, reflect, our London office to reflect the, the diversity mm -hmm. in London. Um, that's what we're aiming for and we've given ourselves a three-year plan to get there because it's obviously it's not something you're going to achieve overnight especially as we're in the midst of a lockdown and people are losing jobs left right and centre it's not going to be something you're just going to be able to achieve so we've given ourselves a smaller step for next year but a much larger step for the following two years to get to the numbers for uh, London's diversity which we've taken we originally used the UK census for numbers but then obviously London is very different mm -hmm. so um, we went to the GLA we used the GLA numbers for London so yes but um, it really come from the top down <laughs> and um, obviously you at the beginning you touched on the impact that all of the government measures had on your organization from an operational standpoint I'm just inter interested in finding out what the response has been uh, both from your leadership, but also internally at four to the most recent measures, where it almost felt like we at one stage were returning to work and being asked to return to work. And there were talk of, talk of some employers uh, requiring staff to come in for a minimum number of days. And, and now all of a sudden, there's been quite a, a, a change. And, and how, how has that change gone down at, at your organisation? Well, we were always under the impression um, and I think it came from the chief exec that we would probably be at home until January. So there was no one really expecting to go into the office. Now saying that the operations director has been in to sort out the post and various other bits and bobs. And I've, I've been in for two days uh, since March and my two days were last month um, to help with people who had left the organization for them to clear out lockers and things. So we had a designated half hour slots over two days for that. But really people aren't going in and people aren't wanting to go in because they, we, were all, we already sort of knew we weren't going in until um, next year anyway. Um, and then I think in the midst of all that, Google and, and maybe one other big organisation, Facebook, I think, announced that their staff weren't going back until the summer next year. So we'd already sort of had this ingrained in us. So it wasn't a big step for us once um, it was announced that there may be six more months of measures. Um, it wasn't huge for us or hasn't been huge for us. There are individuals who are finding it difficult working from home and all we can really do for them right now, because they, they live on their own and they, they're just not stay at home people, is offer things like Zoom or 8x8 and we have it open all day with their team on it. And so they can see everyone and talk to people. It's not exactly the same, but that's the closest we can offer them because we just can't have them. Uh, in the office, I'm afraid. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a very difficult situation. Um, you mentioned that you've been quite proactive with surveying staff, and interestingly, that you've interesting that you've asked them about their feeling towards vaccinations for the flu and um, and and for a vaccine as and when it's available. Um, do you have you asked them about their own mental health uh, and how yes. they well? Yes, so we did ask them that in the survey. We asked, we asked, a, we asked a range of questions. So from um, how they describe themselves feeling, um, their socioeconomic background, because we kind of want to get a full range of everything. So we know where we're starting from. And that's the thing with surveys. You're not going to know where you're starting from. So we might think we've got a load of middle class people working in our organisation. But when you ask them certain um, questions, which are on the census, we, we drew it from the census regarding their own socioeconomic background, i.e. Would you, what would you classify yourself as when you were 14, whether you 
you were well off or whether you had more than your friends or less than your friends, that type of question, you realize that you haven't got a gang of permanently being middle-aged people, uh, middle-class people. You've got people who have uh, grown with themselves so and changed their, di uh, their economic diversity, as it were. So uh, I think this is why we need to have surveys. So yes, we did ask about mental health. We also asked about their financial background. We also asked about how they view themselves, um, whether whether it's their, how they describe their gender or how they feel in the office, whether they can bring their whole self to work. All those questions were asked in the survey, yes, or in a range of surveys, I should say. And um, one of the other things you touched on was uh, the ethnicity pay gap. Um, could you tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing in that area and have you got any advice for any other organisations that might be considering similar initiatives? Yeah, so it's going gonna, it's gonna to be an element of positive discrimination and you're going to have to, if you've all your account managers and above are single, single white females, you're going to have to change that mm. and you're going to have to do something radical, which may be, mean in, employing a senior account manager as mm. a black male, for example. So your numbers can get to where they should be and where they should have been. You're going to have to redress the balance and do it radically. And um, are you, I mean, are you optimistic for, for, for how, how you see that, that playing out? Is there a, is there a willingness um, amongst agencies to, to really disclose that information? Do you think it's, do you think it's something that we're, we're capable of driving forward? I don't think I, I, I think I don't think we're ready to disclose as a whole um, group of a whole body of companies. I don't think every company is going to be ready to disclose their gender pay gap, let alone their uh, any other pay gap. So, um, you know, I think it's something we're just going to have to work on and be seen working on it, i.e. The 2019 figures were X and the 2020 yeah. figures are Y. And so we're going in the right direction. Um, um, but I do feel a sense of positivity and I do feel we are going in the right direction. I do, I do sense it. Yeah, it's interesting. The, gen the gender pay gap was something that businesses were compelled to report on uh, a, a few years ago or businesses of staff of more than 250 employees yeah. um, and there's a there's a feeling that that they that the ethnicity pay gap will, will follow that um, yes and I think the smart organizations are the ones recognizing that and, and planning ahead um, just as a, as a as an aside from this our new race and ethnicity equity board are publishing uh, some new guidance on the ethnicity pay gap um, and that's designed for agencies and in-house teams uh, and just to get them get their brains thinking about the issue there's going to be a few case studies in there uh, with organizations at different stages of their journey and we you know as I'm sure Marcia you know that very few organizations are in a are in a perfect or, or even a good place on this issue yeah. it's about starting those conversations um, and collecting the data crucially um, to allow uh, to allow that to, to take place um, I'm conscious of time and I'm conscious that I've asked you uh, quite a few questions already. So I'm just wondering if there's anyone else who'd like to uh, ask Marcia a question before, uh, before we wrap up. Uh, Lyndon, sure. Yeah, hi, Marcia. How are you? Hi. hi, I'm good. Good. It's interesting in what you were saying about kind of the diversity and, and um, a moment ago about positive discrimination. How do you um, think that we as an industry get over um, making the changes be seen as tokenism so that people from different uh, backgrounds, different ethnicities kind of are being kind of seen that they're being employed because of their skills and because of what they bring to the organization, just not because of the, the diverse uh, background they have? Well, I think we, we need to address some, some fundamental things. I think we need to think about um, whether there are skills that can be that somebody who was never in an agency life before 
but their skills can be brought across to us. And I think those are the types of things we're going to have to look at because we've been too focused on X job title having 10 years worth of agency experience. And we're going to have to not say that. We're going to, we're going to have to do something else because people aren't going to have that. We've, we've, we've got, we've got ourselves in this little bubble where, you know, somebody's niece has come in and she's brought her uni mates in and, and everyone's in one big gang of the same types of people. They, similar age, similar m mindset. And it's just, just not going to work for us. And if we step, take a step back and think about it, it just doesn't make sense. You can't have all the same types of people in an organization trying to deal with clients who are very varied and they've got um, their clients who are also very varied. The general public that our clients are dealing with are completely, we can't have the same types of people coming up with the same types of ideas. We need the variety. So it, it, it will be, it's, I'm not saying it's going to be easy. <laughs> um, I'm just saying we just need to actively do the right thing and it's not a case of this person is a token this person should have been here before they should have been here when they were a grad the fact that we're getting them in when they're an account director is a whole different story but they should have been in our story from before that's that's the way we've got to really look at it awesome thank you i like the idea of looking at new skills as well and looking at how we can utilize the skills so thank you Thanks very much for that, Lyndon. Um, any other final questions before we wrap up? Okay, Marcia, um, just all that's left for me to do is to say a huge thank you for sharing your time. I know you and I were just speaking about how uh, ridiculously busy September can be. So we're very grateful for you taking the time out to uh, join us for, for this week and it'd be great to have you back again um, uh, later on down the line to yeah no uh, problem no problem at all and if anyone wants to get in touch I'm on LinkedIn you can just get in touch perfect thanks Marcia and thanks very much for joining us everyone and uh, we'll see you again next week